namaste good morning vanakkam and so many other ways to greet everyone today so we are today on the 78th episode of the dekho apna desh series and i cannot tell you that how many more are still waiting and that's the splendor of incredible india is it not viewers it's when we started and i've said this earlier when we started people around were like would you be able to do about 25 would you okay then when we crossed 25 would you be able to do 50 we've crossed 75 we are on the 78th one and still going strong and that's the wonderful incredible india for all of you and as covid is sort of um, kind of still playing funny going away still trying to keep the fear factor on yes time still to be careful time still to wear your mask time to be keeping the distances definitely also going in for vaccination in the categories that have been announced by the government we do need to be careful viewers because we don't want covid to take away more time from our lives 2020 has already been dedicated uh, to covid so to say but anyhow life goes on and that's the resilience of human spirit and when we talk of resilience we talk of adventure and the banner which went out today i think itself was uh, pretty self explanatory people typically when you think of india you think adventure you think of the ganga you don't you think of the places uh, associated with the himalayas but you don't really think of the south of india so today talking and walking and cycling and doing so many other adventure activities with us is pradeep pradeep murthy a very interesting profile and also a very encouraging profile i would say in so many ways for some of us who keep sitting on desks and working pradeep uh, was born in kerala and then he grew up in mumbai and then went to calicut to do his engineering does not seem anywhere near tourism or doing something that he's doing now went on to do consulting in different parts of the world for the top consulting companies so seems very much like some of us right but today in muddy boots and since 2009 mudding his boots i think that's such an interesting and an engaging profile uh, pradeep so welcome uh, on the dekho apna desh uh, webinar series and viewers i must also say at this point that when we showcase um, places we showcase experiential learnings about incredible india but it's also about incredible indians it's all of us it's people like pradeep it's all those people who have been on this platform and have presented india through their lens through their eyes through their experiences which adds to the whole experience of what is this dekho apna desh and uh, we were asked in the beginning that would we like to call in a production team would we like to do it through studios no it would have taken away the fun of it all because this is your india and this is the way you want us to see india so therefore today pradeep is going to take us cycling he's um, been telling us his favorite spots for cycling and why he picked on cycling is also something we'll ask him again for public consumption so for anybody wanting to lose weight was one of the motivating factors but so much else uh, in vinard in kurg in places that are so so beautiful so welcome pradeep and um, as i always find something interesting in every webinar so today i'm going to say viewers let's go cycling welcome pradeep thank you very much mr bar uh, first of all thank you to the mot for having me on here and thanks bharti for uh, uh, being so helpful and uh, friendly and encouraging and putting this together um good morning viewers and uh, i think it's uh, i've been looking forward to this uh, and uh, this is quite exciting for me to be able to present a part of india that is not so often associated with adventure tourism <clears throat> uh i'll take a couple of minutes just to maybe perhaps give a bit of background on my own story as uh, ma'am said i was i am not from the tourism industry uh, though i have always loved the outdoors i used to go trekking back in the late 80s and 90s i used to be a rock climber um i am a scuba diver <clears throat> i used to i mean i do a lot of cycling especially long distance cycling and things like that uh and outdoor the outdoors have always you know been a fascination fascination for me uh but uh it was never professional until in 2009 i started uh, got into the tourism industry with my little company 
trying to offer you know day trips and outdoor professional safe adventure for uh, guests. <clears throat> Uh, I chose South India because you know there's so much happening in the Himalayas. The Himalayas are like the Taj Mahal, right? Um, everybody knows about them. Everybody's you know it, they 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 are they are our, you know numero you know place, and nothing can take that away. But then you know like the Taj Mahal, you know it also can dominate everything. Uh, but the reality is that there is more to India than just just the Taj Mahal. Uh, so you'd be much, much poorer if you came to India and just saw the Taj and went back because you would miss then all the rest that India has to offer, which in a sense is the analogy I looked at and said, you know, there's so much more to do in India than just the Himalayas. And there are so many people doing things in the Himalayas. There are probably other parts of India that, you know, we could possibly do things in uh, and offer a different part of India to, to, to travelers and perhaps exp help them explore these parts of India that are not quite so well known. Uh, so I chose Wayanad and Kork to start with uh, because I studied um, because I studied in um, a Calicut as uh, uh, I did my BTEC from REC Calicut as it was then called, and I used to come trekking up in the Western Ghats here, and that is where my journey into the adventure tourism space started. Uh, it's been a wonderful 10, 11 years, and I hope it will go on for a lot more. Um, I'm part of the ATOI as well now. Uh, I am the treasurer for the ATOI and ATOI has been a brilliant source of uh, everything actually. Friendships, colleagues, information, resources, networking, business. Uh, and, and it's been a fantastic uh, experience being with them. And, uh, <clears throat> and I hope that also will go on for quite a long time. Anyway, so getting back to the subject at hand, um, I'll share my screen now. On, uh, so this part of the Deco Apna Desh series, I think that's been a fantastic, fantastic initiative uh, from the Ministry of Tourism, you know, helping us know so much, so much more about our wonderful, beautiful country. Uh, I myself have been amazed by the things that, uh, you know, uh, amazed by the things that uh, are there in our, in our country to discover. And I hope that my session today will explore and will help you, uh, you know, understand a little bit more about what is available in South India maybe motivate and encourage you to find out a little bit more. Uh, before I jump in, I'd just like to say that um, I don't intend this to be an exhaustive listing of every single thing that you can do in South India. That would take days, if not weeks. Um, so this is more around trying to sensitize our, uh, our, our viewers around, you know, this is the kind of things you could do here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about individual operators. I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, mention any names, things like that, which I think would be rather inappropriate. Um, but um, uh, just more than more than that, give you an overview of what is there in South India, right? So this is the area, and we are going to talk about um, the 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 region, perhaps a little bit north of Goa, uh, stretching to the east, uh, near Vijayawada, and then coming down to the south parts of it. Um, the two big defining geographies in this area are one is the Western Ghats, which really needs no introduction, but then my presentation would be rather poorer for it if I didn't talk about it at all. Uh, and then the big chunk of rock we have in that part of the world, which is the Deccan Plateau. Uh, so this is primarily a winter destination, right? Uh, because rest of the year temperatures tend to be a little bit higher or it's the monsoon, uh, which means that it's probably best visited in the winter. And when I say winter, we're really talking about perhaps from about <clears throat> September up until about uh, March or so, early March, mid-March or so. That is when- Philippe, Philippe I'm intervening. Can you just be a little louder? I'm getting some comments. Uh, the audio is a little, yeah, a little louder. I'll, I'll hold the mic closer. Uh, <clears throat> is that, I hope that's better. Yes, definitely. Uh, what I can also do is go to my Zoom and adjust it. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's much better now. Okay. I can in this audio settings. No, it's okay. You can okay. just okay. Uh, raise the volume a bit. Might okay. okay. Um, so it's primarily a winter destination, uh, which is in a sense good because that is when uh, you know the Himalayas are not really uh, accessible for the most part. Uh, which means that it's a great destination to come down to when you can't go up and do adventure in the northern parts of India. Um, the, uh, we, I'll, I'll come to the Western Ghats in a bit, uh, but we talked about the Deccan Plateau, which is really like a table, right? If you remember your uh, high school geography, a uh, plateau is like a table. Uh, it's like a flat uh, land with uh, relatively steep sides. 
The average altitude is about 600 meters or so. It's mostly dry uh, because it's on the leeward side. It's hemmed in by the Western Guards in the West and the Eastern Guards in the East. So it's, uh, you know, it doesn't get too much of rainfall, which is good and bad. The Northern parts of, um, of the Deccan Plateau tend to be hot, relatively hot. If you look at Bellari or Gulbarga and places like that, uh, that tend to get quite, quite warm. Uh, but the southern bits are a little bit more amenable and much more pleasant. Places like Bangalore or Mysore uh, are much more comfortable and pleasant. Uh, then you have the coast, uh, all 200, 2,500 kilometers of, e of it. Uh, it's fantastically full of beaches. Every, every, every few couple of kilometers, you have uh, a beautiful beach that's white and sandy uh, in most places, um, uh, mostly unexplored. Uh, it's fraught with uh, opportunity to do so many, many things. Uh, in terms of uh, bathymetry, uh, what, what the shelf of the coast uh, drops quite rapidly or quite abruptly off the east coast, which means that you get to much uh, deeper depths very, very quickly. Uh, can you see the screen still? I just saw a comment that somebody can't see the screen. Uh, we can see the first screen, which is the geography, if that's what you want to show us. No, ma'am. I'm on the second yeah, slide. I think we need to move it. Yeah. Can you see the second screen now? It says geography talks about text. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Whoever see your slide number three. Yes, ma'am. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, the East Coast drops off a lot more abruptly because the shelf, uh, that's how the ocean shelf is, but as the West Coast is a little bit more gradual, which makes uh, typically, uh, which means that the Western Coast is more amenable to doing activities and things like surfing and scuba diving than the East Coast. Now, having said that, uh, when we come to that part of my presentation, uh, I'll take you through some of the places where you can do those things on the East Coast as well. Uh, the Western Guards, which we had parked for a while. I'm on now slide four. If you can't see it, do send me a message that you can't see it and we'll uh, figure out why. Uh, so the Western Guards is the one of the showpieces of India. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, it, ex it extends from you know, Gujarat all the way down to the southern tip of India, uh, over 1,600 kilometers, you know, hundreds of uh, a lakh and a half square kilometers of jungle, forests, and wildlife sanctuaries. There are 39 of them around the place. Uh, but more importantly, that's a photograph, by the way, that you can see on the screen. That's a photograph of the Banasura range, which is in Wayanad, uh, Western Wayanad. Uh, on the front of it, you can see the Banasura Reservoir, which is about 70 square kilometers. Um, more, more, more importantly, the Western Ghats uh, pr probably is the world's, one of the world's richest uh, sources of flora and fauna. There, were o there are over 1,500 endemic species. And when I say endemic species, uh, those are things that you will not find anywhere else in the world, right? And they are found only in the Western Guards. And that includes close to about 150 odd animals like uh, amphibians, uh, birds, and uh, uh, mammals and things like that. And over 1,500 uh, flowering plants, um, which are found only in the Western Guards. So that is probably one of the centerpieces that <clears throat> uh, uh, to which adventure tourism owes its uh, big namaste, because without the Western Guards, we would be a lot poorer. Uh, it, it offers so much of potential to do things here. Um, of course, uh, on a side note, um, there are various challenges that the Western Guards is facing, deforestation being one of the primary ones. And uh, uh, to the most part, the forest departments uh, of these uh, three or four states are doing a great job, but it's an ever-present danger. And one of the requests I would have uh, to any visitors to the Western Guards would be to make sure that you do so in an eco-friendly manner. Uh, keep keep plastic away, make sure you don't start forest fires and keep all those, I mean, keep in mind all those good practices that you should be following when you're coming to a forested area. Uh, the Western Guards also has is home to the world's largest populations of tiger or the Western Guards and, and ancillary regions and elephant. Uh, as an example, Bandipo Tiger Reserve has uh, close to about 500 plus uh, uh, tigers. Um, it's the largest population of tiger in India. 
so when we though we normally think of tadoba or you know the northern uh, you know ranthambore and places like that when we talk about tiger spottings in fact the largest number of tigers are found in nagarhole uh, bandipur mudumalai satyamangalam those those that huge uh, contiguous area of wildlife reserve and forest which is about 11000 square kilometers uh, that's also home to the largest herds of asiatic elephants uh, tens of thousands of them um they you know congregate in large herds uh, it's very common to see elephant especially in places like wayanad or kurg and uh, the nilgiris um they also uh, do have a challenge around you know man animal conflict uh, but for the most part you know uh, those are things that you know it's difficult to say where the problem lies uh fantastic safaris that are organized by people like the jungle lodges and resorts in karnataka uh, into nagarhole and dandeli uh, the kerala forest department does some lovely walks in periyar um, and and these are things that you know you should really not miss if you come down to this part of the world but having said that you know all you sometimes need is just a drive through those areas there are many public roads that drive that go through those uh, sanctuaries like places like tolpetti and wayanad on the wayanad kurg border uh places like mudumalai on tamil nadu kerala border uh there are public roads which pass through these forests and just a self drive through that is just absolutely brilliant uh this pick is of a bison um it's a male bison uh it's taken bison indian god it's not strictly bison actually uh this was taken in valparai in a t estate um again this is valparai is uh just on the kerala tamil nadu border uh accessible by a single road uh, from either kerala or tamil nadu uh, largely full of tea estates but uh, this particular one is about 2000 acres uh, organic tea estate and it's absolutely chock full of uh, wild i mean wild gaur uh, valpara is also famous for one other animal that's quite famous um, the lion tail macaque uh, and that's one of the places where you will see wild lion tail macaques just like you see langurs in so many other parts of india um I'll give you another example of the kind of endemic wildlife and flora birds that are there in this region. <clears throat> um one of the birds that was discovered in uh, Wayanad for example was something called the Banasura laughing thrush. Right? Now the known population of this particular bird is just about 5 to 700 individuals. That's it. It's found only in this region. It's found in sky islands. It lives only in altitudes of over 5000 feet. and it's such a rare bird it's a tiny little bird about you know about 8 inches long uh, looks it's a very loud bird you can hear it but not spot it so often uh, but that's a great example of the kind of wildlife that is there in these regions right the banasura laughing thrush is so endangered if you think about it there are about you know six times as many tigers as there are banasura laughing thrushes so watching i mean getting to see one is you know very 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 rare <clears throat> So that's a little bit of the kind of geography and the flora and fauna. <clears throat> so what can you do here which is probably the main part of my particular presentation today. So that's a word cloud, right? And you can if you can make out the different words in there and I hope you can. You'll see that there's pretty much nothing that you actually can't do here. Right? The only thing you might not find there is high altitude trekking. We don't have snow, uh which is reasonable I think. But beyond that <clears throat> i think you know when you're talking about trekking rafting kayaking camping zip lines canoeing parasailing paragliding motorcycle drives 4x4 bamboo rafting uh, you you name it you know scuba diving surfing water sports snorkeling i think almost every single thing that you would want to do as an adventure enthusiast i think you know uh, is definitely available in in south india so let me take you through some of those and uh, hopefully that'll give you a taste of what you can expect here <clears throat> so let's start with some of the more common <clears throat> uh activities that people think about like trekking uh, mountain bikes riding uh, zip lining 4x4s uh, bike rides and things like that now what i've done is on the map that you see on the screen and i hope you can see what i'm showing you here i have indicated with little uh, red ovals you know the kind of the areas where you can which are which are kind of amenable to doing these kind of things and i'll walk you through these areas <clears throat> so <clears throat> up <clears throat> starting from the top right uh, uh that 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 little uh, spot is actually a little bit more to the right and to the top i'm really talking about the araku area in andhra pradesh which offers some fantastic uh, opportunities for trekking uh, it's also home to interestingly one of the coldest places in andhra pradesh um, it goes down to about 4 degrees 
uh, in, in that place. And, you know, it's not something that you would normally associate with a place like Andhra. Uh, coming on south, you have the fantastic Pradeep, areas. Yes, Pradeep, Pradeep. people are requesting for a slightly higher volume. Let me do one thing. Let me just see if I can adjust my uh, volumes on this, on my audio settings. Just give me one second, ma'am. Or you might just need to talk a little louder. Because Is that you... better? Yes, it's better. Definitely. Okay. So I've, I've increased mic volume on my laptop. Yeah, thanks. That's me. Sure. Sorry, viewers. Uh, I'll, I'll talk louder and I've also increased the uh, volume on my uh, laptop. Uh, if you still can't hear me, let me know uh, and I'll try, try and talk a bit more louder. Um, so, yeah, so I was talking about Araku on the no north, uh, northern part, I mean, the top part of, top right part of my uh, screen, which is where my mouse pointer is. Coming down uh, the area near Madurai, which is uh, that Ambasa Madurum area adjoining the Western Ghats to the west. Uh, and then to the west of that is the most probably the one of the most famous areas that you might have heard of in South India, uh, <clears throat> uh, which is um, the Munar, Periyar, Thekadi uh, range, uh, which is uh, you know quite spectacular. Um, it is probably one of the most well-known places in South India, uh, and uh, you know we have hordes of people who come there, but not all of them go do a lot of trekking. So my suggestion would be if you're coming to a place like Munar. Uh, go a little bit further out a field, right? And explore areas around Munar. Munar town itself is nothing uh, spectacular anymore, but there are so many areas, wildlife areas and uh, parks and walks and treks around that region, uh, which you can go and explore. <clears throat> yes, I have a comment. Yes, I was mentioning Lambasingi. It's about 30 kilometers from Araku. Um, that's right. Um, uh, to the south, near Trivandrum, you have places like Agastya Muri, uh, which is offers some great trekking around that region. Again, it's all part of the Western Ghats. Uh, going further north along the along that, <clears throat> we have some lovely areas to the northern parts, which is where I am located at the moment, and around Wynad and Coorg and the Nilgiris. The Nilgiris biosphere is a uh, uh, within nested within the Western Ghats itself, uh, which itself is a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. So beautiful opportunities for doing some treks there. Um, and then f going up further north, you have areas around the Mahavir Wildlife Sanctuary, Dandeli, and places like that, which offer some great trails. Uh, all of these locations also offer spectacular opportunities for MTB rides. Now, mo both treks and rides typically tend to be day programs, right? So um, unlike uh, maybe the Himalayas, where you might go for, uh, you know, a, 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 you know a, a week or two weeks or three week long duration treks and walks, uh, in the south, it typically tends to be, uh, you know, a few days, a day or two, a few days. Uh, and, and that kind of has its own advantages because, you know, it's accessible to a lot more people. Not everybody uh, may be amenable to, you know, camping out in the wild for two weeks. Uh, and the kind of uh, fitness levels you need for that are also much higher. So places like this and day hikes and uh, two or three day hikes offer a lot more opportunity for perhaps the average individual to uh, do these kind of activities more often. Um, the altitude is also much lower, so which means you're not really going to struggle with the problems of high altitude, uh, you know, like mountain sickness and edema, cerebral or pulmonary edema, breathing difficulties, things like that. So that is also not a challenge in these places. The temperatures are also typically much, much more pleasant. Uh, we are really talking about once you go on a hike, we are really going talking about you know something around the early 20s to maybe late 20s, early 30s kind of temperature range, which is quite pleasant. Um, most places tend to be very, very heavily forested. So um, unlike the, again, the north, which is mostly pine forest and uh, things like that, uh, here we have, you know, dense tropical and equatorial, I mean, tropical forest typically and rainforest, um, full of animals to the, for the most part, like we saw being part of the Western Ghats, it's quite uh, heavily uh, populated with elephant uh, and other mammals like tigers and leopards and uh, boar and uh, bison and things like that. So uh, it's essential that you go with people who know the place. This is not a, a location where you want to uh, saunter off on your own. Uh, you do need proper support to do a trek in this location. Uh, so I would strongly encourage that you know you go with a responsible operator. Uh, in terms of cycling. Uh, <clears throat> And of course, just, 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 just also make sure that you've got the right permissions. Because in many places, for very good reasons, the forest department does not allow uh, trekking into the forest. 
there are places where that is allowed. And so if you're heading for a trail into the forest, make sure that your operator or you, you have taken the appropriate permissions from the forest department. Otherwise, you are seriously going to get into trouble. Um, MTV, okay. MTB, I think this location offers you, you know, unlimited kilometers of trails. You know, I, 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 I've cycled here for a month and not come to the end of it. Uh, mostly, again, uh, Kurg is a beautiful location for cycling uh, because Kurg is full of coffee estates. Uh, the winding back roads to these coffee estates are absolutely spectacular. Um, locals are very friendly. So here's a picture of somebody cycling uh, near Kurg. Um, that's a little uh, photograph from one of the programs we had done a few years back. Um, you have little back trails like this. Some are off-road, some are uh, broken tarmac, some are good tarmac. Uh, Kurg also has very little population because it's got so many estates, uh, which means that you know uh, it's quite relatively safe to cycle out there. Again, but the, make sure that you're going with somebody who knows the location uh, so that you know you don't get lost. And uh, you know, in case you need something, some emergency uh, help, there is somebody to hand. Now, Kerala also, uh, by the way, holds um, the India's only UCI recognized mountain biking festival. It's called MTB Kerala. It's been conducted uh, five times now. Um, and uh, there's efforts uh, to make it a much bigger event. Uh, so if MTB cycling is something that you know catches your fancy, uh, by all means, keep a watch out. And the Kerala Depart I mean, Tourism Department will be organizing this hopefully this year again. We didn't do it last year. Uh, but hopefully this year it'll happen. Um, the other nice bit of uh, cycling and trekking in this region is because these are day hikes and uh, or a few day hikes, and you're going through so much of populated countryside, it's wonderful to mix it with local culture, local customs, people stop at a little uh, tea shop, have something to eat, or have a cup of uh, tea, uh, talk to, you know, interact with the people there, uh, maybe stay with the local family, things like that, right? So it becomes not just a pure adventure tour. If you could, you can do that if you wanted to, but um, because of this, you know, it's much more, uh, it's much nicer to be able to mix up your adventure with a bit of culture and, you know, culinary, you know, food and things like that. Uh, at, at, locations are mostly accessible, right? Um, the, you won't have very remote one way uh, streets, uh, which, you know, which are going to take you days to get to. Uh, and that means that, you know, places you can get in and out, make, your vacations can also be much shorter, uh, which means that, you know, you can take time off, even a weekend or a three or four day holiday is something that is very viable. Whereas if you wanted to do something like a Valley of Flowers trek or a big uh, hike in the Himalayas, you're going to have to plan a lot more, your holidays a lot more. <clears throat> Health facilities are fairly decent um, in most places, so you shouldn't have too much of trouble. But it's, uh, but having said that, do make sure that you know, who we are going with has got you know proper first aid uh, training and they're taking a first aid kit along and the, you know, they have the local contact numbers of hospitals and medical people. Uh, a couple of shots again, uh, you know, just so you, so you get an idea of the splendor of the Western Guards. That's a shot again of the Banasura Range. It's one of my favorite locations to trek, by the way, as you might have guessed by now. Um, that's that's the beginning of a trek. It starts, it's not a very long, difficult trek. It's a beautiful location. Um, I was leading the trek uh, and uh, we, we go up and there's a beautiful viewpoint and uh, the initial part of the trek starts off through rainforest, uh, which then opens out into uh, the grasslands, um, which is called Shola. And then you carry on and you loop your way back. By the way, uh, the mountains here, uh, if you look at the picture, I, I hope you can see that a bit clearly, you'll see that this bit here is, you know, light mossy kind of uh, texture and it's big trees here. But that's Shola, right? That's a mix of grassland and Shola. So places where the, uh, there's a cleft and where there's a joint in the mountain, like a, <clears throat> like, like, like a fold in the mountain, that's where waters and water and streams are found, which promotes the growth of larger and bigger trees. And that's a patch of Shola. And then the exposed parts, uh, because of the wind and the sun and the lack of water there, um, you don't get such tall trees and it's mostly grassland. So the grassland plus sh Shola is dark green in color. Uh, grasslands tend to be lighter green in color. So it uh, gives you some beautiful photographs and you know, it's really lovely to watch. Uh, got some nice big zip lines in this area. Uh, motorbiking rides. <clears throat> Again, uh, the, a lot of the um, MTB trails that I talked about, uh, some, uh, some, some portions of those are good tarmac. And you also have fairly decent roads in most part, right? No? Uh, so great opportunities for doing big, long motorbiking holidays. You might be sitting on a motorbike, but not 
riding all the time. So that's a photograph of a, a program we had done some time back where you know we're just doing a bamboo raft crossing on the motorbikes. Um, so yeah, you can have things like that also as part of your trip. Right. Uh, in addition, um, this region also has a lot of uh, tea estates. Um, the tea estates are perfect for four by four off trails because the trails that wind through the estate are already there. Uh, you're not disturbing the local ecology. The, you're not disturbing the flora and fauna there, which means that you know you can safely do a four by four ride in a tea estate. And most tea estates tend to be several thousands of acres, which means there's loads and loads of space to do a real proper ride. And you'll have a mix of you know uh, dirt, uh, swamp, slush. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a great place for doing four by four rides. Lots of four by four events that happen here. Places like Kurg and Wynad, they host. Uh, or even the southern parts like uh, Tekadi and Munar, uh, they are you know they have a huge number of clubs uh, which uh, do a lot of four by four off road jeeps and uh, driving. So again, uh, you know, do reach out, just do some googling, and you'll find some hardcore enthusiasts who'll be happy to you know take you out on rides and rides. Right. So that's a lot of the land based bits. Oh, okay. Yeah. So rock climbing and bouldering. So this is again an area which, you know, most people again tend to think of the Himalayas, but probably the Deccan Plateau, given the nature of its uh, surface, you know, there's some fabulous opportunities for doing some great rock climbing and great bouldering. Uh, uh, whether you're looking for big faces, you know, like a, a thousand, two thousand feet uh, tall uh, rock face of granite, or, you know, whether you're looking for small boulders that you can try and uh, do some technical problems in them, uh, you know, Places like Hampi, Bangalore, uh, Brahmanagaram near Bangalore, you know, they, are some, they offer some spectacular rock climbing opportunities. Um, I started my rock climbing days back in 93 near Bangalore. Uh, really used to enjoy it. Um, and uh, by the way, Ramnagram is where Shole was shot. Um, all those, um, you know, nice scenes that you see of uh, uh, Amitabh Bachchan and uh, <clears throat> uh, the rest of the Anhema Mali and everybody else, that was shot in Ramnagram back in the 70s. Uh, a lot less explored then, but uh, rock climbing has become very, very popular around in and around Bangalore. There's some great clubs and associations which will take you from you know doing nothing about rock climbing uh, to you know being an expert in rock climbing. Um, and today, equipment is available uh, all over the country. Uh, there's some great dealers in uh, Delhi uh, and other parts of the country who can supply you very good quality equipment at uh, very good prices. Uh, these these are internationally uh, certified uh, UIA certified C certified equipment. So if you are going into getting getting into something like this, make sure you use the best equipment that's possible. Um, don't compromise on your harness or your shoes or your carabiners or your helmets and things like that. It's really really not worth it. And the first time you have a fall, you will realize why that equipment is absolutely essential. Okay. Um, another great place for <clears throat> uh, rock climbing is Gandhikota. Uh, Gandhikota is probably uh, you know one of the undiscovered gems of in, of, Kerala, of India. Uh, it's a fabulous canyon, and I, uh, I, I, I couldn't find a picture of it today uh, that was not uh, royalty free. Uh, and somebody had said they would send me one. Unfortunately, I think they forgot to. Um, it's it's a beautiful canyon. But if you do a Google for Gandhikota, and it's spelled G A N D I K O T A, uh, it offers some spectacular canyoning. Right, it's uh, the, the canyon itself lies between two reservoirs, which means that the between two small dams, which means the water levels are fairly stable and it's good clean water and calm water. You can do canyoning, you can do kayaking, you can do rock climbing there, uh, you can do stand up paddling. Uh, some spectacular sports out there. Uh, Gandhikota is it's really genuinely a marvel, uh, and if you haven't visited it, uh, you absolutely, absolutely should. Uh, the state, the Andhra Pradesh state offers some really good state run facilities as well, including a uh, institute that can teach you uh, basics of adventure tourism. So you know, do check it out if you have some time. Um, so here's an example of one of the rocks. This is uh, BM Beta uh, near Bangalore. Uh, it's you know, about 900 feet. It doesn't look like it on that picture, but close to 1,000 feet, nine pitches. Uh, offers some really fantastic uh, technical uh, challenges out here. Uh, you know, anything from a fight and see to fight well, which is probably means that it's not for beginners, but uh, there's some, uh, but this is just an example. You know, there are zillions of these, uh, you know, rocks and opportunities around all over that region. Uh, so Bangalore, Ramnagaram, uh, Thrilli near Bangalore, um, uh, Hampi, Hampi is a great spot again uh, for rock climbing. It's probably the mecca of bouldering uh, in India. Um, you've got some fantastic opportunities in Anantapur, etc. 
Yes, Ms. Brad. Yes, ma'am. Is this the place where Shole was shot? Ramnagram? Ramnagram, yes. So this is that famous uh, Shole spot, isn't it? Yeah, this is close to it, yes. So people from our generation will remember the yes. epic, epic uh, Sambha. Viru. Uh, Viru. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There's also a vulture sanctuary there, by the way. It's India's only vulture sanctuary in Ramnagram. Uh, and it's it's also home to a lot of brown bears. Right. So moving on to a bit of water, uh, things like rafting, uh, whitewater rafting, kayaking, canoeing, places like that. And on the south of India, again, the Western Ghats offers you so much of uh, rivers and streams and water. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know, almost unlimited possibility for these kind of things. I know that whitewater rafting typically is something that people think that happens only in Rishikesh or in the Ganges, but uh, places like Dandeli, uh, fab fabulous uh, whitewater rafting out there, um, places like, uh, you know, uh, Anakamboil or Kodanjeri in the south, which is uh, part of Calicut district, uh, that's where the Malabar kayaking festival happens every year. Uh, it's one of the best uh, places to go kayaking. That's where the uh, these streams and the rivers from the Western Ghats, you know, hurtle down into the coastal plains. So you get class three, class four rapids. Uh, and for gentle, for beginners, you also have gentler stretches where you can do class one and two. Uh, but you have some serious uh, good whitewater uh, stuff there. Here's a photograph from the last kayaking festival that happened there. Uh, there's there's an amateur and a pro section as well. Uh, so if you're somebody who likes a bit of kayaking uh, or white whitewater rafting, do come down. It usually happens during the monsoon because uh, another. Uh, sorry to interrupt again. What's a yes. good weather to come for this? Uh, for the uh, for the whitewater thing. Yeah. For whitewater, it's monsoon. That's when there's enough water. So typically, so July, typically uh, July, August. So this July. this this particular thing that photograph you see on the screen, Ms. Brar, is from last July, uh, from 2019 July. Okay. That's when the festival happens, roughly. Uh, since we're talking about uh, doing the adventure trips to these areas, let's say for this one, how close are the stay facilities and what, what kind of options would people have? Or is it far? How, how does it work? Uh, so this is uh, not too far from Calicut. Uh, this would take you maybe about, you know, uh, less than an hour from Calicut City. Calicut City has everything from five stars to budget hotels. Enough and more options there. Uh, if you could also, it's only about an hour from Wynard, uh, which is just up the hill. So enough and more uh, accommodation facilities in Wynard as well. There are close to about 3000 plus rooms and uh, you know uh, homestays and five-star resorts and everything around in Wynard. So again, a good There's amount of- for every budget. Uh, yes, you yes. You'll get a room both in Calicut and Wynard, you will get a room uh, from anywhere from thousand rupees per night to you know 50,000 rupees a night. Okay. Uh, all, all, all spectrum, the whole spectrum. That's great. And it's not far. It's quite quite close by. Okay. Thanks. Pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, backwaters, of course, offer you huge amount of options to do kayaking. Um, you know, the backwaters. By the way, the uh, one interesting fact that most people don't know: Kerala has two backwaters. Uh, the one is the more famous ones near. Alapi, which you must have all heard of, the one with the houseboat pictures. Uh, there's also almost as big backwaters in the northern parts of Kerala, near Kannur. Uh, Kannur is home to Kerala's latest air, international airport, uh, which has made the backwaters far, far more accessible. Daily flights from Delhi, Bombay, and uh, many other parts of the country, uh, which means the backwaters there are you know, uh, very, very accessible. Uh, it's not so commercial yet, uh, which makes it, you know, much more beautiful in my opinion. Um, and 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 it, it's pristine. And uh, the the you know the the adjacent it's so close to the sea. There are stretches where you know there's a maybe a you know one of the walks we do in that region is you know there's a little strip of land which is about you know fifty hundred meters wide. On one side you have crystal clear backwaters, and on the other side you have you know kilometers of you know beach with nobody on it, not a soul on the beach. Um, a spectacular place. And that little strip of land, there are no roads. So you can only walk there, um, which makes it quite special. Um, uh, kayaking, of course, you know, like I said, there's, you have more uh, adventurous kayaking, like, uh, you know, what I showed there, or you can do more flat water kayaking or paddling and canoeing. Uh, 
uh, the backwoders offer you plenty of options for that. Uh, the various uh, circles I have in this area, you know, that you can see on the picture. Now, again, starting from the top right, that's uh, Bhavani Island near Vijaywada. It's the largest uh, you know, freshwater island, I think, in India. Um, uh, the state of Andhra Pradesh also has a lot of options in that area around water sports. Uh, Gandhikota again offers uh, things like stand-up paddling and kayaking on the river. Uh, along the western coast, uh, you know, near Trivandrum, which is Kollam, uh, Astamudi Kyle offers spectacular operation, I mean, opportunities for you know, water skates there. Uh, places like, um, you know, just coming up coast, the Alapi areas, of course. Uh, and then you have the northern backwaters, places like uh, Wayanad and uh, Kurg offer whitewater rafting. And Wayanad doesn't offer, Kurg offers whitewater rafting. Dandeli offers whitewater rafting uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, one other interesting product that you might not have seen from uh, in other parts of the world, uh, India, is bamboo rafting. So bamboo rafting is quite different from whitewater rafting. It's a far more gentle uh, ride. So here's a picture of bamboo rafting. Um, so it's a it's a lovely, gentle, relaxing ride on a placid river. Uh, you know, you have bamboo on both sides. Uh, you have you know views of the tea estates, uh, and you know it just gives you a very different perspective of that environment. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, yes, Pranav, uh, Bhimeshwari too, absolutely, sorry. Uh, great water sport options there, my apologies. Um, this this particular one is from Wayanad. Uh, in in Periyar, uh, the Kerala government also offers uh, uh, bamboo rafting, and that's for probably the only place in the world where you can go bamboo rafting and wildlife spotting at the same time, because the rafting is done on the backwaters of the Periyar uh, sanctuary, and uh, you know, you, you have, it, it, it uh, adjoins the Periyar Wildlife Sanctuary, which is a tiger reserve. So you can often see elephants and other animals coming down to drink water. So probably the only place in the world where you can go on a bamboo raft to spot animals. Uh, more water, uh, you know, this this is probably the only thing that you can't do in the Himalayas, right? Uh, scuba diving, snorkeling, surfing, uh, and uh, that is why probably you know we have the the the, the brochure for this particular talk featured. A uh, shot from scuba diving that was in Kovalam, by the way. Um, and uh, you know, I think I think the girl who was in that picture, I think she was absolutely chuffed to bits about that particular picture being used for this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, so, so scuba diving, typically, uh, you know, the uh, the bottom left picture there, which is Lakshadweep, I think most people know that Lakshadweep offers some really nice uh, diving. Um, having said that, uh, more spots are coming off the mainland as well. Uh, I'll just take you again to the right uh, top. Uh, this bit here is near Vishakhapatnam. Uh, it's starting up to be a scuba diving spot. Uh, Pondicherry has become a great, is starting to develop as a scuba diving spot. So Bharti, when you're there, maybe you can check out some scuba diving there. Uh, recently, a couple got married underwater. I don't know if you had seen, there was a viral video that was going around. Uh, a, a couple decided to get married while scuba diving underwater. And the lady was in a sari and the guy was in a trouser and pants. Uh, trousers and shirt, and they had a wedding. Uh, I think that went quite viral around the world. Uh, the advantage of places like this is that these are very, very undiscovered, uh, which means that you get to see some very pristine reefs, uh, clear, crystal clear coral, uh, which, and it's not, uh, it's not got overdived like so many locations around the world. Um, for the south here, this is up near Tutukuran, that is uh, developing as a surfing spot. Uh, among the best waves that you can find in India. Uh, a good time to go if you're a beginner to surfing is the first part of the year, January to April, when the, you, know, you don't have the big waves. It's water. You do have some waves, but not big waves. Uh, avoid the monsoon if you're not an expert uh, surfer, because that's when the biggest waves, and some of them, there have been waves recorded of over 20 feet, uh, which is huge. You know, it's a huge, huge wave. Uh, up north, so Kovalam uh, to the west coast, uh, Kovalam Varkula is developing as a surfing hotspot. Uh, Kovalam is also becoming a spot for parasailing and uh, scuba diving. Uh, great options in that space. Uh, we have uh, the northern uh, coast near Mahe, which is a great surfing spot. Uh, Netrani uh, Island, which is about 14 kilometers off the west coast of India near Murdeshwar. Uh, Murdeshwar's claim to fame at the moment is that enormous statue of Shiva that you might have seen. Um, that's Murdeshwar. So uh, fantastic diving out there. That picture on the right uh, of an eel was taken at Murdeshwar. This was taken some years back when I dived there. Crystal clear water. Uh, you can, 
uh, you can you can you know see 40 feet down to the bottom uh, and you know it's absolutely crystal clear water it's like diving in the caribbean uh, and then uh, further up north uh, you know that that is uh, murdeshwar and then further up north goa offers great snorkeling uh, some re really nice diving as well uh, goa is probably where diving started in india we got some really well established operators off there uh, and uh, i think uh, it's quite safe the way they're doing uh, one of the good things about Cuba is to be a scuba operator, you necessarily have to be, you know, either PADI certified or SSI certified, which means or BSAC certified, which means that generally uh, you can expect uh, better uh, levels of safety and uh, you know maintenance of equipment uh, in, uh, when you're going scuba diving. So that's the famous picture from the shot, and uh, that's a shot of uh, parasailing. Uh, this started very recently. This is just uh, kicked off uh, near Kovalu. Um, parasailing is also offered in some parts of Andhra, uh, but I believe that the government there is uh, re-looking at some of the permissions and licenses. Hopefully that will get solved out very quickly. Um, and um, here's, some, uh, here's a shot of somebody skiing near Varkla. Uh, so yeah, so, so some really, really great option, options out there. Uh, going further afield, I think, you know, in addition, uh, the, the other uh, outdoor options like paragliding, uh, camping, you know, glamping, so many of these things. Glamping is glamorous camping, by the way. Um, you know, all of these options are opening up uh, in South India, right? And and this is this is from Wagaman. Uh, really nice opportunities to do uh, paragliding here. Uh, there's some paragliding that happens in uh, Andhra Pradesh also in some locations. Uh, camping, of course, uh, you know, what can I say about camping? You know, it's one of the great things about doing camping here is, you know, the, the, the fact that you're probably very close to the jungle. There's so much of greenery next to a rainforest. It's a very, very different experience. Uh, one of the things we started trialing recently was also camping in a, in a, in a, a tea estate. Now, a tea estate typically is about two or 3,000 acres. So it's a very different feel to sleep under the stars uh, with nobody around you for, a, for, for several kilometers. You know, it's, it's a very, very amazing feeling. Uh, in addition to more traditional, all these activities we just spoke about, you know, there's a lot of scope to do more nature related or special interest things like bird watching. Like I said, the Western Guards offers you, you know, incredible potential to do, to see endemic birds like the Banatsula laughing thrush uh, and, and many other, the, the, the hornbills and uh, the, the, so many, I mean, words fail me at the moment. Um, there are so many endemic species of birds, I mean, of butterflies, frogs. There have been uh, tours that we have done which are specifically just on butterflies or just on frogs. Uh, we recent, a couple of years back, we did a bird watching trip for 42 days. And all that couple did was go do bird watching. And every couple of days, they were in a new spot and was spotting something new. So that's the the beauty of you know coming down to this part of the country um and not to take anything away from the himalayas or the northeast i think they are quite spectacular as well and i've intentionally not included western india because you know i think the areas around the northern western guards near pune and uh, kamshed and the mahabaleshwar and all mathiran all that i think that deserves perhaps a session in itself and also it's probably a little bit better known because of the proximity to bombay and pune i think bombay mumbai mumbaikers and punaites have been you know great uh, outdoor aficionados for a long time and i think those areas are a lot better known so i thought maybe i can focus a little bit on the southern parts of it which are not quite so well known uh, as i said uh, you get fantastic mixes of nature and culture and a bit with a bit of adventure mixed in so it does it makes for a lot more multi-dimensional holiday rather than being unit unidimensional um, so these holidays tend to be you know softer so you're not going to high altitudes the safety factor is you know uh, much uh, not not quite so risky uh, you you don't need to be super fit uh, so if you're trekking up to 15,000 feet you really do need to be reasonably fit uh, which is not the case when you're coming down south uh, you can be you know a little bit on the let's say, let it go side and you'll still be fine. Um, you can make quite creative itineraries because of the proximity to people and cultures and all that. I think there's opportunity to do, be very creative in making a holiday because you can have, be trekking one day, cycling someday, doing something, something in the water sports. The coast is not far from most places. So you could mix up your holiday with different kinds of activities and then throw in a bit of food and culture along with it, right? And it makes a really fun kind of holiday. Um, repeating this, you know, the accommodations all over the, all over the South, I think, you know, accommodation is really not a problem. I mean, any kind of accommodation, any budget, uh, really, really not a problem. 
Uh, it's very well connected, uh, lots of airports all around the place. Uh, the big ones, of course, are Bangalore, Chennai, uh, uh, which are the two big ones. Hyderabad, of course, is a little bit more further north. Uh, but then you also have places like Cochin and Calicut and Trivandrum and Kannur, which has opened up recently, Mangalore. Uh, all of these places very well connected by flights. Coimbatore is another example. So lots of good um, you know, flight connectivity all over the place. Um, very briefly about my company, we started in 2009. Uh, we offer activities in all of these places. We are approved by the MOT. And, uh, you know, I really hope that, you know, uh, this is something, this, this little talk is something that will motivate you to explore South India uh, a bit more and perhaps uh, plan your next holiday in this part of the world. Uh, I'm open to... Thank you so much. I think uh, it's been a very interesting journey and so many options. The bamboo raft is something I had never even seen. And it did seem like a very interesting and a very exciting option to also be able to see the wildlife with it. I think uh, somebody's asked a question about Lakshwadeep Islands. I'm a little confused about its accessibility and the permissions required to visit. How developed is it? Are there good scuba diving places there? Uh, the Lakshadweep is accessible from Cochin. Uh, you have uh, uh, ships which go there and you have flights uh, also. Uh, I don't believe there are any particular restrictions about visiting it. There are resorts which have opened. Uh, one of the good ones uh, you know, has opened just recently again, reopened again. So I don't think that's a problem. Uh, in terms of scuba diving, it's been long of a scuba diving spot. I think, I think back 20 years back, I think uh, Mr. Prahlad Kakkar used to offer uh, scuba diving in, in, in mm. uh, Lakshadweep, very long time back. Uh, so yeah, so, so there's lots of options there. Lots of options. And also viewers, I must share with you that uh, there is a whole new focus on the island development. And uh, in fact, Niti Ayog is spearing it uh, for the government. And hopefully very soon you'll have even better uh, development, better facilities coming up both on the Lakshwadeep and the Andaman side. And there, there is, of course, um, always the tightrope between how much more development, especially for the fragile ecosystems. So what kind of development? So we, we are looking forward to a very uh, eco-friendly and a sustainable development in both these parts uh, of India, which is very, very beautiful. Uh, the other question which has been asked uh, quite a few times earlier too, because we do get new people joining in every session, is that what really happens if you miss the live recording? Well, have heart because all the webinar recordings actually go as part of the Dekopnadesh webinar series that gets posted on the Ministry of Tourism's website. And uh, therefore, if you miss out or if later, sometimes we are watching, but we are not actually traveling. But if you plan to travel a few weeks or months or years down the line, that's the time you really want to have that information all over again. So these will be permanent repositories available on the ministry's website. So all 77 that were done before this are already there. And you can find this one also in a few hours from now. So NEGD, which is uh, part of the digital learning initiative of the government, the MyGov, that's the platform which drives and has been helping us since 14th of April in bringing these webinars to you. So it's, I think, uh, a great way to know about your country and for all the friends who log in from all over the world also. I think we get so much uh, feedback and input from all of you that you're learning a lot about India. I am learning so much about India. I think it's not just about it's not that you will be able to necessarily go everywhere and not everything may be suitable to what you prefer to do. But I think just the sheer splendor that exists it itself is so heartwarming. So, so thanks to the viewers, in fact, who've encouraged us, who've been with us all these uh, weeks and weeks and months now. And we are almost going to be one year old on 14th of April. So that, that's a lot of support from you. I also want to leave a, a message through these recordings and these sessions always is that, as I said in the beginning, it's your country and we would love to showcase it the way you want us to showcase it. So like Pradeep, like so many of you who have taken up the profession as a passion, or we have had viewers 
who are doing something entirely else, but have sat home and have put pictures and videos together simply because they want to show certain regions in the way they want to. It's your program. So reach out to us. Our coordinates are on the Ministry of Tourism, Tourism's website. We do take time sometimes to give you the slots only because there are so many people who already have sent uh, their vision of, to showcase. So there might just be a little waiting, but surely we really value each of you who's reaching out to us and saying, I wanna showcase something of India. So whether it's about the food, whether it's about the textiles, whether it's a dance forms, whether it's a music forms, whatever that you feel is something that you would want to showcase and you would want people to, to relish about India, to enjoy about India, please help us in creating that good content and posting and keeping for posterity on the Ministry of Tourism's website. So uh, some more things that uh, came up on the side in the questions on my phone also, Pradeep, were around the safety issue. Then how do we ensure, especially as the number of users are increasing, the interest is increasing, how do we make sure about the safety part of it? Uh, great, great question. I'm glad, so glad you brought it up, right? It is, I was just going to ask for a couple of minutes to just talk about that part of it also. I think um, like, like so many other industries, right? Uh, adventure tourism also has its own share of people who are not quite so scrupulous. And, um, you know, that does present its own challenges. And I think, um, you know, there, we definitely do need regulation in this country. And I would request that the government step in. I know it's it's perhaps a bit challenging given that the state center, uh, uh, you know, problem that is there because state the tourism is a state subject for the most part. Um, but having said that, I think uh, it'd be wonderful if the central government, you know, and the Ministry of Tourism, you know, kind of champion uh, state governments to kind of take up regulation around uh, adventure tourism, because it's a question of people's safety. Um, at the Adventure Tour Operators Association, we have put together a set of guidelines, uh, which we are encouraging and you know, uh, engaging with state governments to uh, adopt them. Uh, some of the states have, some of the states are in the process of doing that. Some of the states, st states have taken a little step forward by making it regulation. For example, Kerala has, uh, Uttarakhand has some regulation around uh, uh, rafting specifically. Uh, but, but I think, uh, really speaking, uh, we need to have uh, all the states really mandating registration of adventure tour operators and you know following of safety guidelines. Uh, and I think that is absolutely essential. And once that comes in, I think uh, that in addition to ensuring safety for people, I think uh, from the industry's perspective, you know, uh, in, uh, insurance providers will be able to provide, uh, you know, proper insurance products because they will now have a yardstick to measure if somebody is doing it properly, is safe and following the right set of rules. Uh, and that once regulation and insurance uh, coverage comes in, I think we can then probably hope for better investment or much larger investors coming into this space because, you know, uh, that is something that will help the industry grow also much, much faster. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so it's not just a question of safety. I think it's a larger picture. And I think it'd be wonderful if the MOT uh, and the government you know, took a specific interest in that. Definitely. Uh, I think uh, one of the learnings for all of us, I think, in the sector of tourism, as we are growing in, in the sector, is that there's been a sort of an organic growth to the sector rather than a little more uh, regularized and regulated. So I think the, as we are picking up as a sector, the need to regulate and to make sure that there are no negative uh, externalities and it improves the ecosystem and also improves the environment and creates the whole safety, particularly when we talk of adventure, I think are very important learnings and uh, we benefit from all the input that we get. And I'm sure we can look forward to to a little more organized way of doing things without making it so deterrent based that you know it, it becomes yeah. difficult to even enter the space. So, so finding the right balance between creating regulation, but not pushing people away that, oh, it just becomes impossible to, to work in that space. So I think that that's an important um, learning for all of us and we should uh, definitely work on that. There's a question on how to get to Lakshwadeep. I think you take a flight somewhere into Kerala, Pradeep. Yeah, from Cochin. You can get flights from Cochin. Fair, fair. There are also uh, uh, sea-based, I mean, ships also available. Okay, fantastic. So on the bamboo uh, raft, I could see that uh, there was a guy who was probably the guy who's technically qualified to do the raft, but then there were three women on that raft. Mm -hmm. And I immediately noticed and wanted to share it with the viewers that, look, 
and there is a lot of uh, sometimes apprehension that how safe is it for women to travel in India. Examples like these, and we focused on that in many of our other webinars that uh, just like anywhere else for any person, whether male or female, you need to be careful of your environment. So applies there, yes, thanks for sharing that again. So definitely sending a loud and clear message. Here are three women enjoying themselves and they, they don't uh, send any message of feeling unsafe, right? So I think uh, with the regular normal uh, precautions that one would need to take anywhere in the world for both men and women, I think that's a message that this picture is very important in terms of conveying. And why I'm also mentioning that is because 8th of March is the International Women's Day coming. And uh, so the next uh, webinar, which we shall be hosting on the coming Saturday is going to be done with uh, the Airbnb, which we, I think all know about and how they have collaborated with women's organizations and how the livelihoods for women are being crafted through tourism. So while we enjoy the fruits of tourism, but we also realize that we leave behind a lot of livelihoods. So for us, we are creating those memories, but for all those people who are making their livelihoods through tourism, I, any part of the supply chain that it may be, we are actually helping people generate livelihoods. And so I think there's so much of feel good factor in that. And that's also therefore a huge call out for the Atmanirbhar Bharat and a huge call out for vocal for local, Domestic tourism is increasing in a big way. And so therefore, thank you all of you for spreading the word the, of the Kopna Desh. And with a country like ours, where you know you are never short of ideas. The, in fact, I think one of the challenges, and I'm sure Pradeep, as a professional, you'll agree, the hard part is what all to showcase and what not to showcase. There's just so much. Yes. Yes. Always a challenge. Always a challenge. So there is nothing that we don't have in India. And if you see the facilities, if you see the airports, Pradeep, you just mentioned about Kanur, uh, the airport. There are more than 130 airports across India now. The yeah. flight connectivity is very, very good for most parts. And therefore, there is no reason why we should not start exploring our incredible India. So next week, we are going to be taking you to a very different journey and it will, of course, also tell you on how people create livelihoods, but it will also take you on some very interesting elements of tourism. So as always, I kind of sort of run out of time. But uh, Pradeep, last few thoughts on if you were to pick, we are into end of February, and if you wanted to call people to this part of the world in March, what would be the three places? April, what would be the three places? Uh, in this part of the, this, this time of the year, honestly, uh, you know, what you could do is it's a great time for water sports. Uh, I think the, uh, places like Kovalam, uh, or, or surfing and scuba diving, it's a great time because the waters are not too rough and it's a great time for beginners to come. Um, uh, March also, you know, is a great time to do wildlife spotting. Um, so places like Nagarhole, uh, you know, you can get some beautiful, sp great spottings of tiger and leopard and because the animals, the forest card is sparse and you can see a lot more wild animals at this point of time uh, than you can normally. Uh, and the animals also move around a lot because they're looking to find water. So yeah, those would be my top two picks, really speaking. Uh, All this right. time of the year. Uh, okay, so we also got a question on what are the options for solo travelers? I get a feeling uh, Bala Subramaniam is asking that most of these are group activities. No, not really. Uh, not really at all. Uh, you know, uh, there's most of these activities uh, are things that you can do uh, by yourself. Uh, you know, whether you're going scuba diving or you're coming, going out for a trek, uh, you know, quite happy to, you know, we deal with everybody from single people to, you know, groups of much larger groups as a company. Uh, and I think uh, any of these people could come down and doing a motorbike ride by yourself is also great fun, as long as you've got adequate backups in place uh, at the end of a phone. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know why, I, if, I'm sorry if I've given that feeling that it's a group activity only, by no means, no. Uh, all of these are things that you can do on your own, absolutely without a problem. Uh, and even as a solo traveler, I think there are enough accommodations also which would suit your budget. Uh, right. Shouldn't be a problem at all. Right. And I must share with you viewers talking of the solo, uh, the ministry is uh, going to be uh, supporting the initiative of a solo cyclist 
who's going to set off from uh, Guwahati on the 7th of uh, March. It's a solo cyclist and it's a 10 day thing. It's a thousand kilometers in uh, those 10 days. And it's all about staying at local places and taking you through these beautiful uh, parts of the Northeast of India. So uh, solo is very much, uh, in fact, becoming the flavor of the season in some ways. Mm -hmm. But of course, you need to prepare, you need to know your uh, routes, you need to make sure that you have the technical help on the way. You don't want a flat tire or you don't want to lose your way. So definitely it requires doing homework and uh, it's a good idea to definitely at least consult a specialist, even if you don't uh, want people around you. And it's good to know who to call the emergency. So the usual precautions that are required because you don't want to just go like a jaja board and then get lost. So... <laughs> And cause a lot of trouble for everybody else trying to find and rescue you. Absolutely. Uh, so there is a question from someone who says, what are the well-known names that offer scuba diving services? Also, I heard only Andamans and Lakshadweep is good for scuba in India. Um, I will not answer the first one because I think a good quick Google search will tell you a lot about the diving operators who can do uh, things uh, here. I mean, uh, may I, let me ask you this, may I off, uh, offer some names, Ms. Brewer, as part of this? Is it all yes, right? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I can tell you the ones that I have dived to with this Barracuda diving in Goa. Uh, they've been operating for a very, very long time. Uh, we have Bond Safaris, which offers some great diving out of, uh, out of Kovalam. Uh, we have some great, uh, uh, you know, we have some good, uh, there's Planet Scuba, which is based in Bangalore. Uh, so yeah, and you have Barefoot Scuba, which offers some great options. Uh, so yes, these are some good, well-known names. Uh, look, I think I think the key thing that you need to uh, think about when you're offering a uh, choosing a scuba diving operator is, you know, one, how long have they been? Uh, ask them about their accident record. Look at how many people they send down with the dive master. If they're sending on sending down twenty people with that one dive master, it's not a good idea. So you want to have controlled groups uh, and ask, make sure that they are going to buddy you up. Uh, and if you're if you're, if you're trying to do a discover scuba, also just make sure that you know they have enough experience doing it. I think that's the key to it. Uh, uh, so, so, so don't go for price. I mean, you really, really don't want to choose your scuba diving operator because somebody offered you 500 bucks lower. So please don't mm -hmm. do that. Uh, yeah. And is Andamans, yes, Andamans offered some spectacular diving. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, Andamans started becoming popular as a diving destination, I think in the 2000s, uh, offers some great diving. I think uh, it's expanding. Uh, earlier, it was just off Havelock, most of it. Uh, but I think a lot of the other options like Neil Island and Ross Island have been opening up now. I was fortunate enough back in 2007 to go on a recce trip in the Andamans where we were trying to discover new scuba diving spots. Um, mm. And you know that was with Dive India a long time back. Um, and it was fantastic because we were literally asking fishermen where you catch fish, where do you get the most fish and then just literally jumping off a boat and seeing what's underneath. So yeah. that was really, really good fun. Um, yeah. So yeah, so but but off the mainland, uh, like I said, uh, so so there's some great places which are uh, opening up. Uh, you know, Vizag has uh, just opened up scuba diving. Uh, some lovely spots there. Um, uh, Pondicherry has opened up, uh, and I I was corrected by somebody saying that uh, it was the man in the wedding picture was not wearing trousers; he was wearing a dhoti. So I stand corrected. Fair enough. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Kovalam in south, uh, in Triv or just near Trivandrum. Uh, that's offered, or just starting to offer some great diving. Uh, Netrani, just off Murdeshwar, great diving there. Uh, really speaking, I mean, uh, near Rameshwaram, there's some diving which has started. Um, there's diving which is off Goa. So I think, yeah, lots of places which are opening up. And I think the diving fraternity in India is also growing quite, quite rapidly. Fantastic. Uh, so keep clued on, keep looking at the websites. Google is the answer to a lot of questions these days. And of course, we are there. You can always reach out to us. Uh, we'll take one last question. Uh, uh, I'm presuming that it's from somebody who is uh, slightly older, perhaps, but then this question is for everyone to, to you know, benefit from why there are no adventurous activities suiting to their age so that they also enjoy and feel elated. We have Mr. Gera asking us that question. Um, I will ask Pradeep, of course, to answer, but I would say things like going for gentle walks or treks or strolls, suiting to one's um, fitness parameters or age is, is always an option. But Pradeep, I'll ask you to take that. Um, Mr. Gera, I mean, um, 
I think we are, you know, having a very, very shifting paradigm here, right? Perhaps some years back, or maybe a couple of decades back, or even a decade back, there was this uh, feeling that, you know, once you're over 30 or 40, you know, adventure sport is not for you. And I think that that perspective is changing very, very rapidly. I mean, uh, we very so often have guests who are in their 60s or 70s doing treks with us. Uh, we have had people celebrate their 80th birthday with us on an outdoor walking holiday. Um, you know, um, we have had people even, you know, we recently had a 76 year old lady and her uh, 79 year old husband who did about 20 kilometers of off-road mountain biking with us. Uh, but I think the key, as you perhaps correctly point or perhaps that is what you are trying to say also, is that I think um, the, the challenge level, the level of difficulty needs to be tailored to suit the audience. Right. Uh, I think not everybody, I mean, an 80 year old perhaps does not want to climb you know, to 8,000 feet, you know, but that is not the intention. Uh, but at the same time, there's absolutely no reason where somebody reasonably fit cannot do a 5,000 feet walk up, right? And it's, it's, it's in, a, in a nice forest. I think the experience is not just about the destination and something like this. I think it's also about the whole process of getting there. So when you do even a nature walk, I think it's about the flora and the fauna and the explanation, the context, the history, all of it that makes up for that day of trekking. It's not just because you reach the top of the mountain. And I think that's that's something that is uh, thing. So so um, is it? it uh, by no means did I again uh, mean to suggest that any of these activities were only for youngsters. Uh, I think that's uh, perhaps an outdated paradigm today. I think I think we are really trying to offer uh, you know activities for all ages and all age groups and all abilities. Um, so yeah, I mean you know. Fantastic. Yeah, so Mr. Gera happens to be the special correspondence from the Voice of Chandigarh and the Voice of Canada. And uh, he mentioned that senior citizens have started traveling for domestic uh, destinations, mm -hmm. which is so very wonderful to know. And uh, as for everybody else, and of course, as I said, depending on your fitness levels and everything else has to be factored in. But I think what really, really at the end will keep us going is the spirit that whatever I can do, I must push myself just a little extra and do that bit. Well, as we are talking about it, I just got input from the CMD of the Shipping Corporation of India. There's this wonderful lady who heads Shipping Corporation, uh, Harjeet Joshi. And there is a session coming up on uh, the opportunities in maritime financing and insurance on the 3rd of March. I will post that um, on the group's viewers. So for everybody looking for opportunities in maritime financing and insurance, uh, it's the Ministry of Shipping, uh, Ports and Waterways, Government of India, uh, which is going to be uh, partnering with FICCI and coming up with this session on the 3rd of March. I'm sure we can benefit from that and find uh, ways on how to improve uh, all that nature has given us and how to use it to creating those beautiful, uh, absolutely amazing memories that every travel brings. Truly out of time now. So thank you so much, Pradeep, for um, a wonderful presentation. And thank you, NEGD, for partnering and supporting us so very well. But most of all, thank you, viewers, for being a part of this amazing journey of Dekho Apna Desh. And uh, it's becoming... Um, an iconic word in the country now and we are so happy with all the support it's you who make this program for us so just keep supporting us and we shall keep bringing the splendor that india is so we meet you on the 6th of uh, march now at 11 a.m bringing you uh, some very interesting uh, stay options and how we create livelihoods and also focusing just a little more on women because eighth happens to be the international women's day so till then देखते और दिखाते रहिए अपना सुंदर अतुल्य भारत और हमें सपोर्ट करते रहिए नमस्ते